I just finished rereading uh, the book by Oliver Sacks entitled The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat, um, which was a book that I read when I was a kid. And it didn't really give me any new insights. There were some, now that I have more knowledge about the stuff that he's talking about because of my... Um, because of the stuff I've researched and read and studied over the past 12, 13 years, um, I had a better understanding of what he was talking about than I did when I was seven years old. Um, what I was struck with more than the contents of the book and what the book actually gave me through its contents was the idea that... Um, a couple of ideas. First of all, the idea that the books that we read as children or read as children, um, if they are real books, not novels necessarily, there's nothing wrong with novels or fairy tales or fantasy or science fiction or any of that, but if they are real books that speak to real truths that deal with real things in, in daily life, um, how much those books form us as we go forward, how much they form our vision, how much they form the things we dream of improving and doing and pursuing and the things that make us curious and catch our attention. It made me wonder how much that, um, the written word specifically, um, written well by people who genuinely care and can genuinely communicate what they're thinking, how those things affect us as we go through life. Um, and I personally, I think they affect us a lot. I, thinking back while reading this, thinking back to um, at being a kid and reading and really enjoying reading books written by doctors because of how um, clearly written they were, how categorically they were laid out. Um, they weren't confusing, they weren't complicated. While they dealt with maybe complex issues, they weren't, um, it wasn't like reading philosophy, which for me is extremely difficult to grasp because they're just words on words on words. There's no practical application of it. It's just talking to talk. Um, and whereas doctors are very practical, they're very uh, ground the ones that write and are successful and do well at writing are very grounded, very practical, and very clear in their communication. Um, Dr. Sachs is a great example. Dr. Paul Brand is another great example. Um, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross is a great example. You know, they're just very straightforward. They're just very clear in what they're saying. They communicate the point without a lot of fluff and without a lot of extra um, circling the point to get to where they want to go. Uh, anyway, that was that was one thought that I had. The other thought, or the other thing that struck me, was reading the last section of the book, the fourth section of the book, and keeping in mind that he was writing this in the 70s and 80s when the research on autistic children and autistic people in general was uh, limited and reductionist in its scope. And... Um, you know, how they were calling autistic people retarded and this and that and the other thing, which I understand he's not meaning it. He's not meaning it as an insult and he's not meaning for somebody to take it personally. He's meaning it in, he's using the vernacular of the time, which was totally normal to call someone that if they didn't score a certain level on the IQ test, which now we know that the intelligence quotient test is a nearly useless way to actually measure intelligence. Um, I mean, if you go back and look at how it started, the IQ test was started as a way to measure um, students' ability to perform the tests. And then from there, people started teaching to the test. Um, that was way back when it came out in, I don't know, late 1800s, early 1800s, whenever the IQ test first came out in France. Um, Anyway, all that to say, you don't measure an autistic kid based on IQ test um, because they're gifted in ways that normal humans, that normal people, that nor that neurotypicals cannot be gifted. Um, and he gets into observing some of the stuff that they were doing. He was talking about um, a set of twins that 
could uh, that could that could see they didn't they didn't just calculate or know or memorize prime numbers but they could see prime numbers up to 12 digits long which if you think about that to be able to generate to be able to think of in your mind which I'll get into it in a little bit of what they're actually doing um, to be able to think of prime numbers up to 12 digits is insane and takes an incredible amount of computing power. Now, what, you know, and he's talking in there, he's incredulous about how their brains work and, well, what algorithm are they using to be able to calculate this? And he talks with different mathematicians who are like, well, you could use these spatial reasoning calculations to do this and blah, blah, blah. But that's not what they're doing. Um, they were they were actually seeing the numbers and and what's interesting is that the research that they've done now shows that or more recently shows that autistic people specifically autistic people heading towards savantism um, they can calculate things from their body it's not their brain necessarily it's it's an interface from their body so so that they can predict calendar dates, which he references in there. These guys could predict uh, what day of the week it would be of any, you pick a date from here to 40,000 years from now or 40,000 years in the past and give them that date and they will tell you what day of the week it will be uh, accurately. And that is not something that they calculated in their brain. That is something that comes from their viscera, that comes from their gut. And the beauty of being autistic is that you can feel that, that uh, visceral reaction and you can feel that visceral intuition and you see it as if, and, and, it, and so it makes you wonder how neurotypicals can't feel that and can't see that. Neurotypicals can only use their brain to calculate, right? Autistic people autistic savants can actually use their body and their brain and they can practice using their body more to calculate it. Um, the research gets more in depth and whatever, blah, 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 but it's, it makes it, it instead of, so just because autistic kids and autistic people don't fit in with how society wants them to fit in, um, doesn't mean that they're retarded, doesn't mean that they're slow, doesn't mean that they're incapable, doesn't mean that they're not gifted beyond what neurotypicals can actually do. It just means that maybe they can't speak because their energy is focused somewhere else. Maybe they can't, maybe they can't um, interact with you the way every other neurotypical interacts with you. But why is that a problem? Why is that an issue? And so you end up running into problems in our hyper-moralistic society where people have to conform and have to be machines. And that's. And if you're autistic and you run into that, you'll be relegated as useless and retarded and slow and um, put them in a hospital or treat them as a lesser person. Whereas in reality, chances are they're more intelligent than the neurotypicals that are relegating them to that lower status. Um, but just because they can't communicate clearly or their signals are crossed in such a way that they cannot express themselves through normal patterns doesn't mean they're less. And that was something I, um, he kind of worked his way around to, but was, but that was something I definitely didn't necessarily think was complete in the book. Obviously, I think the book is uh, it's a great, it's a touchstone, just like Kubler-Ross is on death and dying, just like Paul Brand's The Gift of Pain, you know, all these different books that were written at the time that were written at the edge of the envelope of um, medical knowledge of the time. They were great books at the time, but as we progress, it's good to look back and it's good to read these things again to see where they were at, to see where they could progress from. Um, but it's also good to read the research being done now that shows that things have progressed, understanding has progressed. But at the same time, we learn from history that just because we think we know everything about a topic doesn't mean we actually do. 
It just means that the newest thing on that, the deeper study of that topic has not been reached. Anyway, it was a good book, but it brought up a couple of things for me. Um, and so I, I enjoyed it and it was great to reread, um, especially being able to grasp a lot more of the neurological stuff that he was talking about and a lot of the disorders that he was going into. Um, now, because of what I've researched and looked up for the last however many years, I can actually cognitively grasp what he's talking about. Whereas a kid, I could just get the feeling of what the writing was giving me. Um, again, speaking to the autistic thing. Um, writing and words speak to me. You get emotion through it in a way that neurotypicals won't understand. Anyway, um, all of that to say, it's a good book. Man Who Miss Mistook His Wife for a Hat and Other Clinical Tales is what it's entitled. Um, Dr. Oliver Sacks is who wrote it. Um, yeah, on to the next one, I guess.